Good morning, Quiet Dell Church family. It is so good to be with you on this Sunday morning. I invite you to take a posture of prayer as we go before the Lord this morning. Almighty God, we give you thanks for another opportunity to come into your presence and worship you. I pray that your presence would be completely real to us today. I pray that you would inhabit our praises and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that today will be a day of transformation where we are changed uh, and becoming more like you. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. How firm the foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you? Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. I ask that you would uh, continually do a new work among us. I pray, Lord, that you would reform our hearts and change us into being more like you every day. I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom. Help us to be the church that you want us to be. Help us to uh, have a passion for reaching the lost and to step outside of our comfort zones so that we would proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. Lord, we lift up all of those who are sick and unwell. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for our loved ones uh, who are dealing with difficult trials and tribulations, Lord. Uh, we lift up uh, all of those uh, who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray that you would just comfort them and give them your peace. We thank you, Lord, for your, for your constant goodness and mercy that you pour out upon us. And now, Lord, we join our voices together as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We thank you for your continued support of Quiet Dale United Methodist Church. Uh, at this time, will you sing together uh, our doxology as we praise God? Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, 
and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. In the early 1990s, Christians in South Sudan began facing a time of incredible persecution. Muslim tribes from North Sudan began, go began going village to village, killing the Christians, particularly the men and boys. Uh, when a village was uh, heard that it was that the terrorists were coming their way, uh, they would actually send all of their male children away. The boys would start walking. Their destination was a refugee camp in Kenya. And depending on what part of Sudan they were from, that, that pretty much meant a 1,000-mile journey on foot. Uh, that's about the distance. If you were to decide that you were going to start walking and you wanted to walk 1,000 miles, uh, that would get you right around to Oklahoma City. Uh, it is estimated that 25,000 boys embarked on this journey. Half of them died along the way due to starvation, exposure to the elements, and some even got eaten by lions, hippopotamuses, and crocodiles. Despite the pain of the journey, despite the hopelessness of the situation, these young men, who were now known as the Lost Boys of Sudan, knew that their only hope for survival was to make it to their destination. So they kept walking. One of these young men was named David Macharia Yacht. David was only nine years old whenever he started walking. Along the journey, he saw many friends die, and he received news that his father was dead. Yet he knew that he had no choice but to keep going. To stop meant to die. David lived for the next nine years in a refugee camp. This means that he lived in a tent with very meager food, for nine years. Despite this hopeless situation, David kept placing his hope in God, uh, and he survived. Relief finally came when a family from the United States took him in. He moved to Philadelphia, where he received an education, and they discovered that he had a talent for running. And so he went to college and became a national champion distance runner. He learned what it means to, uh, he had learned from his past what it meant to keep his eyes on the prize and focus on the goal and keep going. Now, we have all had challenges in our lives, but I can guarantee that none of us have faced anything like having to walk a thousand miles as a nine-year-old while avoiding crocodile attacks. But I do think that this story relates to our faith journeys. The journey of faith, it's long and hard. Though God promises to sustain and guide us, it can, be e it can get easy uh, to get off track. The distractions of the world can be appealing. Uh, but not only that, we have a great adversary to contend with. Scripture says that Satan is prowling around like a lion seeking to devour those who belong to God. The enemy we face is trying to steal the promises from, of God from you. Uh, he's trying to kill your spiritual life. And he's trying to destroy our hope of salvation. Our scripture reading this morning uses the imagery of a race to illustrate how we can remain faithful to God through the ups and downs of life. God calls us to be absolutely committed to the cause. If we aren't, we're likely to stumble along the way. So uh, the first thing I want to point out that the scripture says is that there are a huge crowd of witnesses, people who provide the example. Chapter 12 starts off by looking back to chapter 11. It says, We are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. The huge crowd of witnesses are not only the community we are now a part of, but this includes all of those great heroes of faith. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, all of the people we read about in Scripture are standing in heaven even now cheering us on. With them are our loved ones, the ones who have gone on to heaven. If life is a race, those who have completed it are looking down, cheering us on. Don't give up. Keep up the good fight. This crowd of witnesses not only cheers us on, but they give us an example to follow. You know, I think all of us can probably uh, find a biblical character that we identify with in some way. 
And here's the amazing thing. None of these people were perfect, except Jesus, of course. You have Moses, who was a murderer, and he had a speech impediment. Abraham got into trouble for a few times for lying. David was an adulterer. Samson struggled with lust. Martha was a busybody. Personally, I think I identify best with Peter. I'm passionate and committed, but sometimes I put my foot in my mouth. Each of these people failed at different times in their lives. They stumbled, but they kept getting back up, and they continued the race of faith. They trusted God and allowed God to change their lives and use them for the kingdom. In the midst of COVID, uh, sports are happening without people in the stands, and this has to be tough for the athletes. Uh, When you are running a race and start to get tired, or you're playing football and you start to fall behind, the crowd cheering you on can give you that second burst, the motivation to keep going. In the same way, when you are facing a challenging situation, when someone you love is sick, or you lose your job, or your marriage is on the rocks, you feel like everything is falling apart. It can be very easy to disengage from your relationship with God. Sometimes this happens by accident, and other times it's intentional because you feel like God is forsaking you. That's why we need to be plugged into a church community. The people here will encourage you, pray for you, cheer you on. Sometimes we just need someone to say, what you're going through is hard, but I believe in you. Keep up the good fight. And we need to remember that there is a countless crowd in heaven looking down, the great cloud of witnesses cheering us on each step of the way. Uh, The next thing in the scripture, it says, strip off every weight. And it it mentions two things. It says distractions and sins. As we go through life, we must deal with the burdens that slow us down. As you all know, I love to camp. And my favorite way of camping is to to put what I need in a backpack and go out into the middle of nowhere and hike to a, a secluded place. Now, it can be easy when camping like this to overpack. You know, you throw in the essentials, a a sleeping bag, a hammock, a fishing pole. But then do I really need the two extra changes of clothes and two gallons of water and a cast iron skillet? Before long, it's easy to have 80 pounds in a pack on your back. But if you put that on and you start walking, and especially if you're out of shape, that burden will soon weigh you down. While I could walk 10 miles without a pack, I may be without a pack. Maybe I'll only be able to walk two if it's overloaded. So as you go through life, you will accumulate burdens along the journey. These things will slow you down from spiritual growth. Uh, They will prevent you from hearing the voice of God, and they'll distract you from your essential purpose. I think that there are two primary uh, types of burdens. Um, Verse 1 says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that trips us up. So so I think that we have burdens that slow us down, things that burden us, uh, and then you have sins that trip us up. So what are some of the burdens that weigh us down? I think there are many, but I'm going to highlight just a few. Number one, I think that guilt is a major burden, burden. We feel guilty for past mistakes. We feel guilty for when we have fallen short. We feel guilty for not being further along than we think we should be. But guilt and condemnation do not come from God. Romans 8.1 says that there is no condemnation, no guilt, to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Guilt is a major burden that Jesus wants to take off of your shoulders. Guilt only holds us back from receiving what God has for us. And I think that there's something that goes hand in hand with uh, with with guilt, and that is shame. Shame becomes becomes an incredible burden. Uh, we we feel this shame for who we are, uh, for the failures that we've made. Uh, but shame again doesn't come from God, and it is a burden that if we keep holding on to it, it will just slow us down and keep us back from really uh, living into the depths of the life that God has for us. Another uh, burden that we carry is worry. We in our culture, we are chronic worriers. We worry about our health, our money, our future, our relatives, our work. If you can name it, we can worry about it. But worry is the opposite of trust. It's the opposite of faith. An aspect of faith is a deep trust that God will take care of you. We might need to grow in wisdom so we make better choices and avoid some worrisome situations, right? But I think that God will show us these areas uh, and will give us... Uh, freedom from worry. 
if we ask him. And so those are some of the, the easier ones. And now I'm going to go to something that, that is pretty crucial. This is going to step on some toes this morning. Uh, one of the burdens that we have is a striving for comfort. And this one might seem odd, but here in America, we get so caught up in wanting to be comfortable to the point where it can wear us down. And I'm going to get really real here for a moment. Uh, I think in America, we, treat, we, we teach people that the only way to find happiness or comfort is through having stuff. And the way we get stuff is through accumulating debt, right? That's something that, that we teach a lot. Concern about money and debt and stuff, that worry will suck your spiritual lives completely dry. Scripture actually talks about debt a few times. It says that the borrower is slave of the lender in Proverbs 22, 7. It says in Romans 13, 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And so I want to be clear here. I'm not calling debt or money sinful. But I believe that these are things that are serious burdens that can hinder your relationship with Christ because these things tend to foster worry and stress and distraction from God. It's often related to other things that are sins like coveting or envying what other people have. And uh, now I'm going to give another example of something that's really going to challenge us. Um, We get really comfortable in how we do church. And whenever comfort and familiarity becomes our primary ideals, we lose mission. We grow comfortable uh, of who we see in church and how we do church, uh, and we become afraid of change. We don't reach new people because we refuse to make the changes that are necessary to reach these new people. And if, if a person gets more upset about the color of carpet or the types of chairs we sit in or the placement of a picture in the church, If they're more upset over those things than the fact that we have not led a lost person to Jesus in the past 10 years, then I can say this for sure. Their hearts are not right with the Lord. And this is an attitude that shows preference for comfort and familiarity rather than keeping their eyes on the mission of Jesus. And so I'd really encourage us to, to lean into Uh, surrendering these things to God and saying, Lord, may I see with your eyes, may I feel with your feelings, may may I see the world and the church for its true purpose of reaching the lost. So those are burdens. Those are things that can weigh us down and can and really, really make our spiritual lives difficult. Uh, But then we get into the second part, which are sins. These are things that the scripture says will trip us up. We all have besetting sins, things that will trip us up. And I really don't believe in big sins versus small sins. I think that all sin separates us from God. So if you struggle with lying or envy or gossip or greed, uh, you need to deal with it. Offer it to God. It can be hard to let go of our sin. And that sounds weird, but it's true. Sin has become a crutch that we must learn to live without. Jesus will take the sin if we let him. Uh, Verse 4 reaches a great crescendo. It says, after all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Some translations say that you have not shed blood in your battle against sin. Uh, The metaphor here switches from running a race to boxing to say, you know, our sin drives a powerful wedge between us and God, and we're called to daily combat it. We're We're called to box it out, to even shed blood. Uh, The key to victory is to keep our eyes on the cross and the power it represents. The cross is victory. The cross is power. And and that power is offered to us through the grace of Jesus. So I want to go back for a moment to the backpacking analogy, right? So if I'm journeying through the woods with more than I should be carrying, and if I hit a rock or a root and it trips me up and I fall, well, it's going to be a whole lot harder to get back up than if I had no burden on my back. People who don't deal with their burdens and keep tripping on the rocks will give up unless they decide while they're down to get on their knees and take their burdens off at the foot of the cross. So friends, as we go through this race of life, we must keep our eyes on Jesus, 
He is our champion. It says that he is the author and the perfecter of the faith. He's the one that initiated that faith within you. He began that process of transformation. And he's the one who is making you more perfect every day. Jesus though, is the one who reaches into us and inspires us. It is the initiative of God that puts the spark within our hearts. But he's the one who writes the chapters of our lives if we let him. We must surrender our hearts to Jesus. So friends, know that you have a purpose. It's more than what you do for a living, more than being a parent or a caretaker. You have a purpose as a child of God to be known and loved by God and to share this love and knowledge with others. The glory of God is not that God uses us in our awesomeness. The glory of God is that He knows that we have burdens. He knows that we have failures. He knows that we have things that trip us up. The glory of God is not that he uses us whenever we bear those burdens strongly and march through those things and keep getting back up. The glory of God is is that uh, he accepts us even whenever we're burdened down and on our faces in the dirt. The glory of God, the beauty of the gospel is that he says, you don't have to carry that burden anymore. My child, take it off. You have a choice today, those burdens that you're carrying, to lay them at the altar, to lay them at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I want to know you primarily. I want to receive your grace. As we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll be invited to kneel at that cross and offer our burdens, offer our sins. Jesus will clear our paths. The way that God has for us is that of love and peace and freedom. So friends, Are you weary and heavy laden this morning? What is it that you need to surrender to Jesus? I invite you, no matter where you are, whether you are uh, sitting on your couch or uh, if you are, you know, wherever, uh, find a place that could be your altar this morning, whether it's your coffee table or at the kitchen table, and, and kneel or sit and just offer God and say, God, I want you to take the burdens of my life. I want you to clear the path of sin from in front of me. I want you to help me run the race with faithfulness. May that be our prayer this morning as we go before the Lord. Thanks be to God for his love and mercy. Amen. Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus and live. Now your burdens lifted and carried far away, and precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, and live. And like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to crawl. And remember when you walk, sometimes we fall. So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, and live. Sometimes the way is lonely, and steep and filled with pain. So if your sky is dark, then pours the rain. And cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, and live. Oh, and when the love spills over, and music fills 
the night And when you can't contain your joy inside Then dance for Jesus Dance for Jesus Dance for Jesus And live And with your final Kiss the world goodbye Then go in peace And laugh on glory's side And fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus And live Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus.